So, in 2016, Boom Studios came out with a new Mighty Morphin Power Rangers comic, and it kind of took over my life. Uh, for good reason, actually, because the comics were really freaking good, and specifically as an artist with MMPR brain rot, it just made me really, really happy to finally have a continued source of amazing new MMPR art. The books were popular, Shattered Grid shook the earth, the Ranger Slayer existed, everyone was just thriving. So now, eight years later, the main series has wrapped up with its MMPR recharged era and darkest hour event, and the whole thing was, uh... So a basic summary, uh, spoilers for the main MMPR comics, I'll also only be explaining the recharge and darkest era plot in detail, and assuming that if you clicked on this video, you know about the comics and their concepts and their plot and what's been going on for the past eight years. So after the events of Charge to 100 with the whole zombie ranger thing, the MMPRs are back on Earth and the Omegas are doing whatever they do on Safe Haven. Rita comes back with a new outfit, new name, and a bunch of returning villain OCs from previous arcs, including Hyper Forces villain for some reason. A new bodyguard named Vessel, really the old body of Zordon, to be a host for Dark Spectre so he can cross the Morphin Grid and take over the universe or whatever. She beats up Zed, steals the Zeo Crystal, and rips off Green with Evil in the process. Vessel manages to gain sentience, but she's ultimately successful in summoning Dark Spectre, who takes over Vessel's body and starts infecting the Morphin Grid. Rangers who morph in an infected space instantly become loyal slaves to Dark Spectre. Grace is murdered by an evil Matt and she leaves Billy some power eggs. Rangers from across the seasons are either captured or make it to Prime Earth to try and help with things. At one point, Tommy is captured, but as he has the power of the white light, he can't be corrupted. Instead, he gives Rita a lesson about the cycle of abuse. Draken, in an attempt to find the Morphin Masters and Emissaries, fights a corrupted Ranger Slayer in the grid, where he dies freeing her from the infection with his white coin. Rita realizes Power Rangers Satan is a bad person and escapes with Tommy, and upon return, Zed throws her in a space dumpster. Slayer returns with Draken's white coin, and after reporting the Morphin Masters are useless and the emissaries are all corrupted or dead, they use the two white coins in their possession to link everyone up to the incorruptible white lights so they can morph safely. Slayer decides they need to go to the Zeo Crystal planet in the Void, where the Solar Rangers live, to do one big morph that will generate so much pure morphin energy that the infection will be purged. Billy takes matters into his own hands and shatters the grid by blowing up one of the power eggs in an attempt to slow down the infection. The results are... mixed. The remaining Rangers go to the Zeo Crystal planet and have a big fight with Dark Spectre's forces, but manage to do the big morph, which works, and Dark Spectre is defeated. We get a random flash forward to gritty future Billy who writes in a journal about how he's still trying to fix the grid. The end. So... That sounds like a lot. <laughs> and, and it is a lot. And what's funny is that it's not even all of the characters and subplots that show up in this event. So I do want to make it clear that this event had to do a lot. It's meant to be the finale of eight years of comics, and in those eight years, a lot of characters and plot threads were left open for no real reason. So there was a goal here of giving closure to all these open threads, along with working with the main characters we have here, and including characters from the show to make it work as a big 30th anniversary event. The advertising itself knew this, calling it the biggest event since Shattered Grid. And in terms of length alone, it certainly is, with the recharged lead-up era lasting a year's worth of issues, and the actual event another year's worth of issues, compared to how Shattered Grid's books spanned less than one year, though admittedly built up since the very beginning of the series. Story-wise, it's a bold standard to put yourself to, as Shattered Grid is by far the most popular and well-known storyline of the eight-year MMPR series. The event was so far-reaching that elements like the show, the RPG playthrough, the video games, and the toys were immediately making stuff based off its plot and characters. So, does Darkest Hour meet this standard? On the one hand, it's a bit unfair to ask, considering how the state of the franchise is, uh, let me say sparse, compared to how it was in 2018. But disregarding that, has Darkest Hour reached the same level of popularity and iconicness held by its predecessor? Uh... 
So while everyone knows Shattered Grid as the original giant comic crossover spanning seasons and universes and whatever the multiverse has done to the franchise at this point, it knew what it was at its core. A story about the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and their bond with each other and others and how that's more powerful than any one ranger, even one with the power of a god, can be. Darkest Hour does too much to show how big and epic and connected it is to the past that it doesn't have a real sense of identity. Is it about the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Is it about just Billy specifically? Is it about the cycle of abuse? Is it about the repetitiveness of ranger life? Is it about how one ranger can completely mess everything up? Is it about all of those things? Apparently, because the message the story is trying to tell starts with one thing and ends with something completely separate. So let's start with the theme the event seemed to want to center around at the beginning, which was the concept of cycles and specifically the cycle of abuse. And I have to assume that was the intended theme because it's how this whole thing started and the characters never shut up about it. So Rita Repulsa wants to kick out Master Vile as Dark Spectre's number one because he was a bad dad to her and Rito, whom we never actually saw in these comics, which is a shame considering Rita's comic backstory made her an only child, which brings to question how the heck Rito came around, but anyway. She convinces Alpha One to join her in the promise that she would treat him better than her dad and Zordon did. Draken and Ranger Slayer's relationship is finally dissected as the toxic romance it was always hinted at being, and Draken ultimately dies as a way to set her free. Rita's treatment of Tommy back in the Green with Evil days is brought up as an example of Rita perpetuating the cycle of abuse. And finally, Rita's time with Dark Spectre is clearly meant to parallel someone in an abusive relationship, where she's constantly put down and belittled by a being of higher power who goes so far as to destroy this only support system she has until she finally escapes from him. As the story went along, I had my criticisms of this, especially with Dark Spectre and Rita, because the abuse there was very blatant with no room for nuance or the quieter aspects of an abuser, because surprisingly the biggest villain in the Zordon era is nothing but a villain and has nothing else to him because he's a big morphin grid demon thing. I don't know. <laughs> what even is Dark Spectre supposed to be? But I kind of let this go to see how it would wrap up in the end. Which leads to one of the most confusing choices of the finale, which is that Rita doesn't show up. <laughs> I mentioned before that upon escaping Dark Spectre, Rita ends up thrown back in the space dumpster where she laments over what happened and urges SWAT to run. And you're like, okay, she has reason to be depressed for causing the end of existence or whatever. But surely this is leading to some kind of triumphant return in the end, like where Rita finds some inner strength left, maybe inspired by Squat's words or whatever, and busts out of the dumpster, reclaiming her original name and outfit, or maybe even some new outfit as a call forward to Mystic Mother, or even her own ranger form, because everyone else is getting a ranger form. And, and finally land some sort of final blow against Dark Spectre to finish him off or weaken him so the rangers can land the final blow, right? And no, that doesn't happen. The last time we see her is sitting depressed or at peace, depending on how you interpret the scene, in the dumpster. Uh, and apparently that's where she just stays forever. My annoyance with this is partly because of the obvious. This whole thing started with Rita, so it's basic storytelling logic that she should be involved in the end in some way. But what's also annoying has to do with Boom's writing strategy with Rita these past eight years. So one of the biggest praises the comics got from the start was how Rita was written in a more cold and calculating and threatening way, as a far cry from the goofy, headache-suffering bumbler in the original show. Despite this, the comics would also take advantage of the knowledge that she would eventually turn good by Zordon Z-Wave and become the Mystic Mother to give her sympathetic traits and show how her evilness was more the fault of her circumstances rather than, like, a personal failing, as a way to foreshadow this fate. This led to some discrepancies where she would be shown doing, like, truly horrible things, but then the books would be like, but she's still capable of redemption, she could be redeemed, she has the potential in her, while she's like, 
<laughs> crushing civilians under I guy's feet, but I digress. Rita's capability for redemption is brought up in this very event where she frees Tommy and they both escape Dark Spectre's clutches. And then in the big finale, where they have the perfect opportunity to really redeem her through taking responsibility for her actions and destroying the monsters she unleashed on the universe, they don't take it. So then, what was the point of any of that? Just that we know Rita will eventually get turned good because the show did it? What makes it especially annoying is for some reason the finale brings back Death Ranger instead. It was pretty obvious that Rita didn't destroy them when Dark Spectre wanted her to, but they literally don't do anything in this finale at all besides, like, I don't know, since that Vessel was there. Um, I saw people say that they, like, brought forth Vessel's spirit, but... I feel like that's more of a personal interpretation because I didn't get that from reading it. So why even bother? Why not just have Rita destroy them then and then bring her back here instead to do whatever Spark did with Vessel? I don't know. Zed was also useless, but he's been useless ever since he's been brought into these comics, so talking about it is beating a dead horse at this point. It's just kind of funny to me how they made a big deal over his new ranger form, but it really didn't matter to anything, except I guess in general that he too is threatened by Dark Spectre's corruption powers due to pulling power from the Morphin Grid, though this isn't really discussed. Serpentera's ugly new form was more important to the story than Zed was, which is pretty sad. So, besides the specific cycle of abuse, this theme of cycles in general pops up throughout the event in different ways. The most notable probably being how, in the Recharged era, Kim gets fed up with how they constantly go through the motions of become rangers, fight monster, monster grows big, they bring in Zord, monster is defeated, spurred on by Matt getting captured by Rita and Tommy getting injured in the process. Which is definitely something interesting to discuss, but ultimately it doesn't really amount to anything beyond Kim and Tommy being at odds until his kidnapping. Which, yeah, it's nice that they're the only one of many romances to really have some kind of personal stakes in this. Don't worry, we'll get to the romances. But that's such a minor thing to come out of a conflict that calls the entire foundation of the franchise into question. For the most part, the cycle idea really only comes into play consistently throughout the arc in relation to Rita and her relationships, and that grinds itself to a halt when Rita's put in the dumpster and doesn't appear again. From then on, the book almost shifts entirely to a new plot and new theme and new protagonist, Billy, and the idea of how one ranger working on his own can have disastrous consequences for everyone else. We get a hint at the theme of cycles again at the very end, but put a pin in that for a second. This bizarre flip-flop of the underlying theme of the event ends up making the entire book feel slapdash and flat-out random at points, especially when the themes used don't really apply itself to majority of the characters in a meaningful way. And I mean, a story can have multiple themes. But Darkest Hour chooses to go about its themes in a way that feels so in your face, but then eventually gets tossed out and makes you go, but wait, we were still talking about that, weren't we? Why did we stop? I said before how characters around Rita are constantly talking to her about the cycle of abuse. Grace, Tommy, Alpha One, they all give her some kind of speech about how Master Vile or Dark Spectre or whoever is treating her badly. Eventually, Rita decides to jump ship, free Tommy to serve her own plans, goes back to Zed, gets put in a dumpster, and that's it. I guess there's something to be said here that she chooses to stay in the dumpster as a way to break the cycle, but it doesn't come off that way because she decides to do that four issues before the finale and no one brings her up after the fact. It's not so much we're making a statement about the cycle of abuse so much as we have to thin the cast a bit before we bring in the Solar Rangers. It was suggested that it's fine if Rita does this, but have her do it after defeating Dark Spectre. When he's gone, the Rangers think they're back to square one of facing down Rita and her monsters every week just for her to be like, nah, I'm out, and go into the dumpster, and that would actually be a discussion of breaking a cycle or, or bringing this never-ending conflict to a legit end. I think it's also strange because Rita was more or less the protagonist of this event with how she starts this and gets the most emotional stakes out of everything, and it doesn't feel like a coincidence that once she gets thrown into the dumpster we really ramp up Billy's whole uh, thing and the theme of doing things alone versus doing things together gets put in the foreground which I'll get to when we talk about the ending altogether. I've talked a lot about Rita, but what did the actual rangers do in this event? Uh, they all started kissing. 
So despite what you might hear about Power Rangers being super chaste and not allowing kissing, romance has always been a part of Power Rangers. Funnily enough, it's easier to count which seasons don't have a main romance on the team versus which ones do. And the same applies to the comics. To no one's surprise, like the show, the MMPR series' most prominent romance is Tommy and Kimberly, who get their relationship started right off the bat at issue zero and eventually get together and stay together, not without some conflict, all the way through to the end. So they're always a main part of the series, and typically the arcs might bring in an additional romance between side characters, or a ranger with an OC, or whatever, that ties into the plot of the arc. For instance, Shattered Grid had Tommy and Kimberly, the first hints of Draken and Ranger Slayer, and an implied romance starting between Jason and Lauren. Eltarian War had Tommy and Kimberly and Skull and Candace. Beyond the Grid didn't have Tommy and Kimberly due to them not appearing in the arc, but that had Mike and Tanya, Ari and Remy, and Heckle having an implied crush on Slayer. So on average, the arcs will have about two legit romances, give and take implications that don't become official. Darkest Hours confirmed romances are as follow. Tommy and Kimberly, Matt and Aisha, Trini and Zach, Ari and Remy, Salem and Maxi, Skull and Candace, Draken and Ranger Slayer, Eddie and Vesper. And additionally, Darkest Hours implied romances, where nothing between them is confirmed, but you look at them like this was meant to be something, right? Zed and Rita, Coinless Trini and Scorpina, and Rocky and Adam. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, there's also a scene where Bulk calls Taylor hot and wonders if he has a shot and is really weird, but I guess that's what happens when you're not the more conventionally attractive of the comic relief duo. This is a lot. It's too much. Compared to how previous arcs will have Tommy and Kim's romance as the foundation and then add an additional new one, this one has so many romances to the point where the finale issue features a new romance on nearly every other page. And I love romance. I'm in the camp that's fighting for Disney to bring back romance movies and shelve their oh platonic relationships are just as important as romance ideology, but Darkest Hour takes it to the point where these characters' romances are the only important relationships they have. The friendship and team camaraderie that makes Power Rangers what it is gets pushed to the side in favor of developing these romances that were introduced in this event, which makes it even more annoying when they don't even amount to anything in the finale. Like, was Matt Aisha really introduced just so Matt could have a therapist girlfriend to help calm him down from a panic attack one time? Why did that have to be a romance? And why was that more important than showing Aisha's friendships with Rocky, Adam, or Kim? Trini Zack was supposedly built off of how they raised an alien kid together last event, but the romance doesn't do anything interesting with their characters because their romance is too perfect. Every other scene they flirt and someone looks at them and goes, wow, they're just so in sync. And that's pretty much it. What makes it worse for me is the bulk of the perspective of the romance goes to Trini, while Zack never gets any scene to himself where he gets to talk about his feelings to someone else. He doesn't get much of anything for that matter. Ari and Remy, it makes sense for them to be together, and it allows for some pathos when Remy is corrupted. Salem and Maxi, well... <laughs> As these characters and their relationship were introduced in this very event, three issues from the end, it kind of feels like it came from wanting to give us a legit male loves male romance before the main series ends, one that isn't just a colonizer hitting on a confused teenager, which I respect, but it was kind of soured when Tegan, the blue solar ranger, died. With none of the other solars ever elaborated on, it kind of came off like Tegan got the axe, like she was the expendable one, because she was the only one who wasn't in a romance. And speaking of MLM... So, like... Okay. Rocky and Adam. I want to make it clear that I am not an MLM, so I don't want to speak on what makes good representation. And really my problem with this isn't the idea that they wanted to do a Rocky Adam romance but couldn't because of corporate homophobia or some kind of mandate against making legacy characters gay, so they had to rely on hints and ambiguous handholds. That's just the unfortunate reality of modern adaptations of IP. What I don't like about this is how it comes off how Rocky and Adam don't do anything this entire event. 
The comic sidelining the Stone Canyon trio in favor of the Omegas, or OCs, has been a recurring problem with the comics ever since the Necessary Evil arc, something that can be talked about enough on its own. But their treatment here especially hurts, because the year-long lead into Darkest Hour honestly gave me hope that we'd finally fix that problem. Sure, there were some red flags. Like how once the Omegas came in, their storyline started eating up the MMPR screen time like it had been for the past five years, but the three of them had some genuinely good scenes that showed their chemistry and friendship with each other. But then the event actually starts, and this gets thrown out the window. Rocky and Adam immediately get captured and corrupted. They show up during fight scenes to go, Bleh, look at me, I'm evil! Aisha eventually cures the corruption. They spend a few issues out of the spotlight with the excuse that they're recovering from what happened. And then in the finale, we get that handhold panel and they fight in the big battle and that's it. That's literally it. Two of the main rangers in the MMPR team in this MMPR finale event, and they get no personal arc, no exploration of their characters, and no payoff to them being evil. They basically just get tossed out the window in favor of focusing on other characters until we have to bring them back. And even them, bringing them back doesn't lead to anything substantial. They provide no intel on the inner workings of the ship they were on to shut it down or free any captured rangers. They don't self-reflect on what being evil revealed about them. They don't even really reunite with their team. So do you see why this random handhold just feels cheap to me? I was told there were hints to this romance being built up, but why do we constantly have to be satisfied with hints? Hints that were frankly not good enough considering how much of a surprise this was across the fandom. This is the fandom that clocked Jaden and Antonio immediately. I grew up in the 2000s. I know about the concept of characters that have to be coded as gay because they're not allowed to confirm anything. I was there when Korasami happened. Do not, <laughs> do not read the ancient texts to me. I was there when they were written. But the difference between all of that and this is the coded characters are typically like super close. They have story arcs that focus on their relationship and the strength of that bond. For instance, back in the Charge to 100 storyline, Andros and Zane were one of the focal points of that arc. In the show, they both have female love interests. But here, it was heavily discussed if the two were meant to be in a romantic relationship because the storyline put that relationship in the spotlight in ways easy to interpret as romantic. They grew up incredibly close friends, Zane gets extremely upset when Andros turns down being a ranger with him, and Andros' entire motivation during the arc was to get Zane out of his coma to the point where he was willing to unleash an evil death spirit to do it. Heck, they even drop the love word during a conversation when Andros decides to join Zane's ranger team. It's ultimately ambiguous for the same reason as you can assume it would be for Rocky and Adam. Corporate mandates that probably wouldn't allow legacy characters to be gay. And I can sympathize with that. What I can't sympathize with is the storyline giving no depth or exploration to their relationship or characters just to be like, hmm, are they together maybe? At the very end. That is not the result of corporate restriction. That is the result of the bare minimum, so you can say you actually thought about these characters that did nothing and contributed nothing all event. Overall, it seems to give off the vibe that we think romance is automatically a form of development for a character, which is why characters that don't get major arcs like Aisha, Adam, Rocky, Zack, and the new Solars suddenly all have romances. And I mean, romance can be tied to development. In Tommy and Kim's case, it served as, as an example of Tommy opening himself up to others, and for Kim, a showcase that she was trying to move past the trauma of her parents' divorce and failed romance with Matt. But that should be just like a piece of the whole character pie rather than like the whole dish. Aisha telling Matt that she went to a therapist for anxiety as a kid isn't developing her. It's just a half-assed justification for why she gets to fulfill the role needed in that particular scene. Same as when she breaks up Tommy and Kim's argument in an earlier issue because she hears enough fighting from her parents at home. We don't even get a scene where Aisha gets to talk about this new relationship outside of one scene after Matt's captured with Adam, where she's like, yeah, maybe I could like him, but why? Why might you like him? Because he's a single guy on your team? The only single guy if Adam and Rocky really were together this whole time? Why did we have Kim talking about this new romance between Aisha and her ex with Trini and not Aisha? It doesn't pass the Bechtel test either way. 
but I think we can forgive that if it means we get some insight on Aisha, this new out-of-nowhere romance you've made up for her, and her friendship with Kim that has barely gotten anything substantial since the Stone Canyon trio joined the team. I don't need romances in Power Rangers to be deep or even have reason to exist. But if you're going to have this many romances in one event, I'm going to need something that makes them fun to read and not so repetitive. Tommy Kim was fun in this event because they actually had conflict that led to drama and stakes and them resolving that and being cute at the end is overall super satisfying because they came out of that stronger and more in love compared to how they were before. Matt Aisha and Zach Trini, meanwhile, are both too perfect right at the jump, and there isn't enough variety in their dynamics to make this shift into romance interesting. They just like each other, so they like each other and are nice to each other, and that's it. They try to do something with Trini, whereas the new Omega Red, she, like, learns to chill and not be so serious with their new position. Like, okay, I guess... Honestly, the most I got from her arc is that she and Zack could have centered their arcs around Kia and gotten closure from that whole thing, but these books hate Kia, so... The Solar Rangers romances are hard to discuss compared to the MMPRs and the Omegas because they simply don't have enough time to really showcase their personalities, let alone their relationships. Ari and Remy only avoid this by way of them being prominent characters in a completely different storyline. But they at least don't fall into something like Matt and Aisha's trap of how we've been reading books centered on them for years and never saw them interact once versus how now they're suddenly in love. You can buy that in their own off-screen adventures, Maxie and Salem developed feelings for each other, and we just happened to step into their story at the time when they got together. Yeah, it's another romance that's too perfect, and I don't really know their personalities or dynamic beyond, uh, they both seem serious, I guess? But that's what happens when you get introduced right before the end. Sorry, boys. At least your designs are good. So, all this talk about the MMPRs, and I guess you noticed I didn't talk much about Jason. Jason was also here. <laughs> he lost his powers at the end of the Charge to 100 storyline, aka why Trini is now Omega Red, and even though he was supposed to have moved away then too, he's still around here, which, knowing now it's because it's the finale event, it's, it's fine. If you're doing a big finale for the MMPR comics, you can't just not have Jason. I don't have too much to say about his plot, because for the most part, it was fine. I wasn't really invested because I'm not really a Jason fan, but that's on me, not on the writing. It was a very basic, former ranger learns what to do now that he lost his powers type of arc, featuring Taylor from Wild Force because... I guess Wild Force needed screen time out of all underrepresented teams. I'm not against the idea, and looking at it fully, I guess she was chosen because Jason was basically building a civilian army, and it makes sense to include a ranger that was in the army, but it does kind of come off like an attempt to recreate Jen's inclusion in Shattered Grid, or even the Jason-Lauren bond, though without the awkward, oops, we didn't realize she was 25 when we started teasing a little romance here, side to it. Taylor doesn't really get to do much outside of the Jason plot, and her personality isn't as aggressive and in-your-face as she was in the show, so sometimes seeing her in ranger group shots is like, oh, oh yeah, Taylor is here too. Also, why did they keep mentioning Princess Shayla when Princess Shayla never even showed up? I think my problem with Jason's storyline comes down to, unfortunately, the fandom's perception of it. Being Jason, a lot of people were disappointed that he ended up losing his powers at the end of Charge to 100 and wanted him back in some way. My stance on it is a little more complicated. I think all of the original Omegas should have retired at the end of that storyline, but in general it should have been an all or none deal. But that's a conversation for another day. This basically amounted to people upset that Jason was put out to pasture and that the books were dumping his character, to which I'm reading the story and being like, Jason gets the most one-on-one -on -one development and screen time than any of the MMPRs besides Billy and maybe Tommy. He gets the civilian army arc and discussion of his life outside of being a ranger. He builds up Bulk and Skull's confidence about the good they can do. He's a confidant for Kim and Tommy over their leadership and relationship issues. He gets his own inner timeline ranger buddy through Taylor. He gives Billy his opinion on his shattering idea. He reunites with the Omegas and he and Trini get closure on when they dated for like three months maybe. But I guess since he doesn't actually morph, he was put out to pasture? Boom was avoiding his character because of ASJ's recent controversy? Am I reading a different Darkest Hour where Jason didn't come back at all after Charge to 100? Actually, can I have that please? It sounds awesome. It was such a weird look into the fandom's perception of what makes a good character and character arc. Jason got far, far more than Rocky and Adam, but he was done dirty where Rocky and Adam weren't. Just truly bizarre. 
So we have this big event meant to wrap up eight years of mainline comics with all these characters and plot lines and themes fighting for a semblance of cohesiveness. What could we do to make this work? Hey, remember that tabletop RPG show from six years ago that never made it past one season? That's relevant to all of this, right? So yeah, Hyperforce. You know, with how important Hyperforce has been to the series, that should get to come back in the big finale. That should get its own focus book rather than the Solar Rangers, whose home and relationships actually do play a huge part in the final arc. Because Hyperforce is just so easy for people to get background on and get invested in on top of everything else going on. Like, look. I understand Hyperforce fans kind of got a raw deal with the series ending like it did. But why did you have to make it my problem. <laughs> Shattered Grid had a little crossover with Hyperforce, where Hyperforce gave it its own little focus episode, which was cute as it was being published at the same time the show was running, and it wasn't so integral to the story that comic-only readers had to check it out. But this event really expects you to know about Hyperforce's whole deal, or at the very least accept it and get invested in the characters, particularly everything with Chloe and her evil dad. But at the same time, what's odd about it is it doesn't even lead to anything particularly fun or interesting. It just feels like they had pitched an entirely separate Hyperforce series, only for it to get rejected, so they smashed it into this story instead as a compromise. Evil Hyperforce dad isn't interesting, he's just yet another loyal general working for Dark Spectre because evil and power or whatever. The Hyperforce team does have something of a narrative purpose, being able to travel outside the morphing grid and rescue Ranger when needed, but the characters themselves have no depth to them and not even any fun interactions between other characters. I guess Chloe got to take down her dad in the end, because that's what we needed to bring full circle instead of Rita versus Dark Spectre, I guess. Chloe deciding her dad is evil and no elaboration on the mystery of her mother, which was, like, a thing. Oh, and for those who don't know, Hyperforce is basically like a Time Force sequel, so it's set like 3,000 years in the future, so it's not like they could have gone, oh, um, this random ranger from this season is will eventually be her mother because the timeline is too far apart. Which in the end is my biggest problem with their inclusion. This event has more than enough material to fill a year's worth of issues, to the point where it was too much and not enough concepts got the time to breathe that they should have. Hyperforce is just another example of this. I get wanting to give it closure after its cancellation, but this was just not the place to do it. In the end, nobody won because all the closure was, well, Chloe's dad joined Dark Spectre, but then she beat him. And honestly, considering how they're the only team in the event to not get hit by the corruption at all, it kind of comes off like author favoritism from all points. Chloe and her dad might have been super bare bones, but it was at least some semblance of relevancy to the overarching plot with it being like yet another example of an abusive relationship. To contrast, if say Marv and Joe had gotten corrupted, nothing would have changed. I know I keep repeating the idea of relevancy over and over, but when you have an event like this where there's so much happening and so much being juggled, there needs to be good reason why you have the characters you have. And the idea of the corruption is a pretty neat and clean way of thinning out your cast to focus on the ones who are important. Which leads me to... So, Rangers being turned evil due to spells or whatever is another tried and true Power Rangers tradition, and it's something I've always been fond of. It's a simple concept that allows for juicy angst and self-reflection once the spell is broken. Heck, it's what kicked off these comics in the first place. Tommy's journey recovering from the effects of Rita's spell was wonderfully done and something that was so unique to the comics versus the show. And here in this event, we're kicking it up several notches with the concept of rangers falling victim to an evil spell just by morphing, a really cool twist on both the evil spell and basically a zombie infection. Which makes the fact that the execution of the concept as the event goes on gets super boring all the more tragic. As you're reading, it really becomes clear that the concept of the corruption is really just a means of showing off how threatening Dark Spectre is, rather than anything actually substantial in terms of character or emotion. And I mean, an attempt is made with certain characters. Sometimes Aisha gets to remember that her best friends Rocky and Adam have been turned into evil slaves. But for the most part, what should be an extremely angst-ridden fight between friends and loved ones is basically rangers fighting hordes of goons wearing the suits of characters we know as Power Rangers fans. It's especially weird when the fights against the corrupted rangers Rangers almost get played for comedy. You'll have Taylor kicking Alyssa in the face like, sorry, and Tommy shrugging off corrupted Rocky and Adam's dark confessions with, that's hurtful, guys. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? Is this a tragic circumstance for our heroes, or is it just a regular Tuesday? 
Especially when after Rocky and Adam get freed from the corruption, suddenly it's treated like this was the most traumatic experience in their life and they spend issues on the sides recovering. Not that we actually like see insight on how it felt to be corrupted or this recovery process, just panels where we see Tommy doing meditation with them. Which I mean, in theory, I like this idea of Tommy having famously dealt with being turned evil, using that experience to help others. But frankly, Rocky and Adam don't do anything significant enough to justify them being so shell-shocked. Especially compared to Tommy, Matt, and even Ranger Slayer, who all murdered or got close to murdering someone. An issue or even just a scene of insight on Rocky and Adam from their perspective, not some other character reporting on them while they're off-screen, would have helped this a lot. There's also a really cool cover to one of the issues where a corrupted Rocky and Adam are infiltrating and destroying the command center, and man, that would have been cool, wouldn't it? It almost felt like they were taunting me when they chose that specific cover to be one of the official collected volume covers. The main example of when the concept was used to its fullest potential was Draken facing off against the corrupted Ranger Slayer in issue 116. That was an instance where the corruption really allowed dark truths to be revealed about the character's relationship. We finally got confirmation that Draken did choose Coinless Kim to be his his ranger slayer over anyone else because he had romantic feelings for her and seemed to hope that one day she'd choose to stay by his side even without the spell. To contrast, every other corrupted ranger just kinda appears when there's a big fight scene, they say something generically evil or mean, and then once the fight is done they zap away until the next big fight scene. And the actual scenes of the rangers getting corrupted eventually gets repetitive because it all happens the same way. The rangers see trouble, they decide to morph, and halfway through the morph they go ah with dark energy surrounding them and then they they're evil. It gets to the point where you're less, oh no, my favorite team is evil now, and more, okay yes we get it, morphing makes them evil. Like obviously this handicap is a surprise to the characters, but the audience gets the picture very early on. I think what doesn't help matters is the main characters that actually get corrupted are basically side characters. Like Coinless Bulk and Scorpina who became rangers five seconds ago. Yale whose character is their acute tiger. Kevor who's so nothing that the early issues accidentally show him as escaping with the main group when he was supposed to have been captured. And I mean I'm not blaming the artist for that, mistakes like that happen, but it just kind of shows how like inconsequential he is as a character that he's shown escaping and then we don't talk about him for issues until suddenly it's like, no wait, he's captured. The Solar Rangers, who we just met and don't even get names or even get shown their unmorphed designs. Rocky and Adam, as discussed, who are basically side characters compared to the other MMPRs. Matt and Ranger Slayer are pretty major, but they get freed from their corruption fairly soon after they become corrupted. Because of this, despite the book trying to portray the infection as some great danger, it's hard to feel that when it only happens to characters we only slightly care about compared to the original six. Like, think back to something like IDW Sonic's Metal Virus arc. That felt far more brutal because as the event went on, characters just constantly kept falling to this virus. And not just recently introduced side OCs, but characters like Shadow and the Chaotix and Cream. Meanwhile, there's the constant threat of Sonic himself becoming fully infected if he stops moving. This just felt too sick. I had it in on basically describe it as giving the rangers losses without actually giving them losses. Don't get me started on how Kim seemed 100% pointed to becoming infected to the point where there's like a scene where Death Ranger tries to possess her and tells her some other time then Kimberly when she manages to escape their grasp but Ultman goes number never brought up again god So now, before we get to the end, um, to balance things out a bit, here's some stuff I genuinely like or think the event did well. Overall, looking at the first year and the second year, the first year felt far more successful as an overarching narrative. Every MMPR had some decent focus, Rita's story where she comes back as Mistress Vile and the establishment of her increased threat level was good, Vessel had potential to be a tragic but nuanced character, we had some shocking moments like Zed becoming a ranger, the death of Grace, and the return of Alpha One, and in general, every Everything moved along at a pretty good pace. I'd say the only real problem I had with the intro was how goddamn in your face Matt was and how much everyone loved Matt and just how heroic he is and just how tragic his continued ripoff of Tommy's storylines, I mean his false evil is. But if I get started on that, this whole video will turn into Matt hate, so let's move it along. I promise that's coming soon. 
As you could probably tell from the romance section, every facet of Tommy and Kim's relationship was written super well, especially the Draken Slayer portion. It was short, and I wish we had more time dedicated to them with their weird divorce situationship, but I'm very happy they finally came out and confirmed Draken's interest in her was romantic. It adds so much complexity to their dynamic and characters, and I really hope they come back in the future one day. Tommy in general is written well, and I wish he had gotten more time to shine after he gives up the white coin to power everyone else. He gets to meet his Dino Thunder self, and while it's a cute little scene, it could have been so much more after the years of the comics having him afraid he would grow up to become Draken. Despite all the continuity errors it presents later in the event, the coinless book is so much fun, and I love rereading it no matter how many times I go, so wait, why didn't Dark Spectre turn everyone into lava zombies like we did here? Why did the main series split the white coin when they establish here that they can't? I wish the event could have given us a panel of the coinless world showing it cured from infection to bring it full circle. Billy and Kia is a genuinely interesting dynamic that deserved more screen time as, a, as an example of blue rangers who are both blue but like Kia's not a super scientist like they try to make all blue rangers nowadays. We finally learned how the salad girl thing from Go Go Power Rangers wrapped up and that was done for me personally. There was a panel where Yale cuddles with Kim and it's the only good contribution to the books Yale ever gave. I liked that Kendall was called Dr. Morgan instead of Miss Morgan. Um, but now we've made it to... While I think for the most part people were enjoying the event, the last few issues introduced a new plot point that, from my findings, left people sort of uneasy about where it was going. Billy, after dealing with unending stress about the situations of the event, and now he's the one tasked to find solutions, decides to destroy a power egg and shatter the grid. The reason for this is he learned from Kia of how the grid splintered itself off like this when Tommy died back in Shattered Grid as a means to protect itself from the ensuing paradoxes that would occur from Tommy dying when he wasn't supposed to. And the conclusion drawn from that is if they broke the grid again, it would, like, stall the infection for a while. While I do want to say this event brings up the grid shattering and the characters worrying about the shattering happening a lot, meaning that this was definitely in the cards writing-wise since the beginning, this ultimately comes to a head in issue 121, two issues before the series ends. So I repeat, an event that was the foundation of an entire previous event, and in some ways the foundation of every single plot line after that event gets shoved into the last three issues of this event. So that's one thing. But then it's revealed that somehow Billy shattering the grid caused Kia and Coinless Trini, who were with him when he broke it, to get wiped from existence and Grace to also get wiped. Or just put them in an altered timeline where she died on the moon in 1969 instead of killed by Matt in this event or something. Rightfully, a lot of people were like, wait, what? The logical conclusion taken from this is that Darkest Hour would end like Shattered Grid did, with a giant multiversal reset. With this being the end of the main series and all, maybe it would turn this timeline into the timeline we know of from the show, set in the 90s with none of the comic introduced characters. Yes, it would be pretty sad to get such a firm ending to this continuity as we know it, but with the franchise itself changing, it would be another instance of a piece of the past that we can close the door on and move on to whatever is coming next. But, um, no. After they beat Dark Spectre, Billy just says, well, guess I'll be spending the rest of my life trying to fix this. And the last page, flash forward, seems to support this claim. He's got his rogue red rip-off outfit and beard and in some kind of dystopian setting? I have no idea. With no hints at where everyone else is or how things are since they won. I suppose if this is going to be a lead-in to whatever's happening in the next ongoing Power Rangers Prime, that's something of a reason for this ending to be more open. But considering that this is definitely the last time we'll see certain characters, or at the very least, the last time we'll see the characters as they were in this series, there's barely any sense of satisfaction or closure. And in general, the way that we've once again got an open ending that focuses on an, on an adult Billy messing things up, but still moving forward with this goal no matter what, is just weird. Why has this been such a consistent narrative choice for his character lately? What are you trying to say with this, rather than making him learn a lesson about learning from his mistakes and living with them. And why have his mistakes led to a death of a Trini twice now?
I would be somewhat more forgiving of this if the grid shattering had actual impact on the finale, but outside of it being a reason for Kia and Coinless Trini to not be in the final issue, there really wasn't. Without confusing the rules of the infection and when they can or can't morph has been throughout the event, I don't even know if it had the intended purpose of protecting the rangers from turning evil. They certainly don't give Tommy his coin back, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> the big finale where the MMPRs morph to do the final blow and Tommy isn't there. You know, the guy who started these comments in the first place. Instead, you put his half-assed clone who stole his first coin and then stole his most iconic storyline and then stole his second coin. You put him in his place instead. Ah! The one... The only thing that kind of works about this ending is the general sense of how future Billy writes about how there will always be evil and there will always be rangers to fight that evil. But I don't understand why this ending was chosen to execute that idea. That's the kind of ending that could be done with Billy retired and moving on with his life watching the next generations of rangers from outside his window or whatever. But as I said, one thing I'll give them is as of this writing, we have no idea if the next ongoing Power Rangers Prime is building off of this ending or not. If it is, I'll give them some leeway, but it doesn't change my opinion that overall it's just unsatisfying for the story we've been following for so long. I know it's been a lot in this fandom to get an ending like this during a time of so much uncertainty. Reception to this ending overall has been super negative, and for once it's easy to see why the Power Rangers fandom hates something. It doesn't ruin the earlier books for me, partly because honestly I haven't been fully enjoying them since, uh, Necessary Evil ended, oops. <laughs> and honestly, I say this in the nicest possible way. The way this event was going, it would have taken a miracle for it to end in any way satisfyingly, so this really wasn't a shock to me at all. But it does make them slightly more melancholy to know that the characters we've followed for so long barely get any sort of good closure. Because of that, part of me can't help but want a fresh start free from the storyline and free from certain characters. But like everything else in the franchise right now, we just don't know what to expect. Except Power Rangers Infinity, I guess. That's cool. That's coming. The polar bear is a Red Ranger, guys. Wow.